Welcome back to Breakfast at Stinson's. This is John Asher Thompson. Today we have a very special guest with us, Gordon Marino. Uh, I think you are going to be blown away by this. Gordon is a uh, philosopher. He is a former football player. He is a boxing coach. He covers boxing matches for newspapers uh, around the country. And uh, he is a Kierkegaard expert. Uh, speaks Danish, reads Danish, um, overused term to call him a renaissance man, but I think that's what he is. I hope you'll stay tuned. Uh, I know I've learned a lot from him, and I hope you will as well. And also subscribe uh, to our podcast, Breakfast at Stinson's. Stay with us. Gordon, I came across you because I was at the bookstore, and um, uh, you know it's funny you sit here, you just never know how things are going to get sold. But I, I, I love Kierkegaard, mm -hmm. and I love philosophy, and I saw your little book, and I, I don't even remember which one. It was a Barnes and Noble, I'm sure, or or an Austin Book People, or one of these places, and yeah. I was like, this is awesome, <laughs> and I love the fact that in your intro, you're like. You have to address the question, okay, how would Kierkegaard feel about a book of quotes? And so uh, yeah. oh, I, I loved your introduction is what sold me. I absolutely loved it. Oh, thanks. And, uh, oh, thanks. and it, I, th I thought it was pretty, uh, you shared a bit about your personal life and, you know, what got you into Kierkegaard and all that. So well, I wonder what Kierkegaard would think about a Kierkegaard kind of Kardashian thing, the Kierkegaard Kardashian it, Twitter feed that has like a half, a quarter million followers. Seriously? Yeah, man. Yeah, they've been coming out with a book that drives me crazy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so they, 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 they merged a Kierkegaard quote with a quote from uh, Kim Kardashian. Uh, what are we going to do about that? I don't know. That's um, that's a whole other topic. So, so, well, first of all, welcome, and thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll keep you about 45 minutes is the goal, maybe a little over, and I don't know. Um, I want to hear – so I want to hear about your life, and, and it sounds like you've had a really interesting life. I want to hear about Kierkegaard. And then the, the genesis of this podcast was about – really the idea of success, but success more in a Cicero sense of what's a well-spent life, right? So you have... That's, that's the way to think about it, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so we, we, we've we been talking uh, with a friend of mine who has been incredibly successful in business. We've had people in in the movies, and we've had musicians, and we've had a football coach. And, um, you know, the one thing I made very clear is that uh, clearly and obviously success in life does not mean making a bunch of money. And I think as Americans, no, I, I try to get my students because I have a lot of advisees over the years, and they always want to, you know, naturally we're thinking about vocation. And I also I just push them a lot to think about what kind of human being do you want to be, you know, yes. and that's the, that should be the ultimate measure of success. And that's hard to hold on to in a world in which uh, to be less than successful in monetary terms is to be invisible in some way, you know, is to not count. And everybody has to have a dream self that they try to fulfill in this society, you know, it's a big part of American propaganda and um but again that dream self is uh has very little to do with being a good person. What kind of what kind of person you want to be. So, I love that you said American propaganda. I do think um I think there's a lot of stuff that, that we as Americans just ingest and take um for granted that just yeah. ought to be challenged. <laughs> like, yeah, and I, I think the dream stuff is what is some of it. The dream the vision and vision of well, that comes up in the chapter on authenticity a bit, but yeah. Well, so so I want to come back to that because I and and uh, uh, but let's start just to, to give. I, I was fascinated by reading your bio. I read a few things uh, about you after I, I got the book, mm -hmm. and so um, you you personally have had quite a journey. Um, and yeah. and we have a limited amount of time, so I'm, I'm the podcast could probably be taken up with just your journey. But can you give us a, just a quick uh, kind of overview of? of your path and, and how you got to where you are. And I love the fact, just for everybody's benefit, um, Gordon is a philosopher, a teacher. It sounds like you can read Danish and, and the, uh, yeah. right. And, um, you're a boxing coach and a football coach yeah, and you yeah. cover the, and you cover boxing for the wall street journal just to hit... uh, not so much anymore, but I used to cover was covering it for HBO and HBO just folded up their tent on boxing. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so, yeah, okay. But so, love, so but many years as a boxing writer, yeah. So where are you from, and, and where are you now, and how'd you get there? Okay, I grew up on the Jersey Shore, where that show was, uh, the, the show of the Jersey Shore, the mm -hmm. same town, right there. And uh, 
you know, I went through a lot of, a lot of different stuff, but ultimately, uh, so, but, but now I'm in Minnesota, University at uh, St. St. Olaf College in Minnesota. I've been here for 25 years, and uh, before there, that was uh, I was the boxing coach and philosophy and psychology prof at Virginia Military Institute. Oh, I didn't see that in VMI, and which is yeah. where is that in Virginia? Lexington, beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in a very tumultuous household. There was a lot. There was a, a, good, a lot of love, but also a lot of violence, a lot of drinking, a lot of bad stuff. Not a lot of respect between my parents. They really didn't get along too well, and that was really hard and scary, you know. Um, and and I and I talk uh, I talk a lot about I got, got in trouble a lot of brought a lot of trouble on myself in life. So especially in the early years. So uh, and which I discussed in the book. Yeah, you said that you, you got kicked out of a lot of schools. Yeah, <laughs> and then yeah, and, and you got in, I, I read uh, that you got in a you got in a screaming match with your football coach on the sideline at one point. That was one of the most embarrassing situations it, at the, in the Ivy League. So I transferred from I was uh, playing at Bowling Green and then got hurt, and I transferred to I had a wonderful philosophy professor by the name of uh, uh, Alfred Serge Kapler, who uh, helped me transfer to. Uh, to Columbia with the help of the, with the help of the football coach at Bowling Green, mm-hmm. and uh, I got there and got hurt and was I was taking a lot of a I was a, a substance abuser and got hurt and then I had a, a, a really bad screaming match with a football coach at Columbia that mm-hmm. ended like I mean like calling him out on the field it wasn't something you did to they saw it too frequently in the Aggie League yeah it was really uh, unbelievably. And how'd you find so so, uh, so you were kind of rough and tumble and coming out of the situation and and yet you end up with multiple degrees speaking or, or reading Danish anyway and a philosophy professor. I can how, speak how'd that Danish. happen? Okay, perfect. I I can't. There was a there was a there was a beautiful girl named Dort who worked at the restaurant where I worked in Paris. Oh yeah. And she was Danish, but thankfully she could speak English. Because you know, they can all speak English. That's part yeah. part of the problem with learning Danish is that you have a choice between speaking baby Danish or or developing a friendship. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, as I said in the book, I you know went through, dropped in and out of schools, uh, dropped in and out of graduate schools because of the insecurities I'd get there, and I think I, I have one seems so smart, I can't do this stuff, you know. And, and I was uh, married to, uh, uh, pretty early on to someone who had a, well, some some problems with drugs and things, and um, that blew up, and I ended up for a couple of years really on the edge of on the on the razor's edge and. I talk about being suicidal and all that kind of mm. thing. So it was really bad. So, so Kier- Kierkegaard and a therapist helped me. Hmm. Helped me. Uh, tell us about. Tell us about that. How? how I mean, there's, yeah, well, I'm I assuming a lot of people don't know anything about Kierkegaard. I happen to have read a fair bit, but just uh, assume right. that assume that your listener doesn't know anything about Kierkegaard. So, sure. how do you help so you Kier- and talk about him? Mm-hmm. So, so Kierkegaard was this uh, often seen as the. Uh, First existentialist and um, lived 1813 to 1855. Danish. Uh, he never considered himself a philosopher. He always called himself a poet. And uh, even though he was appropriated by philosophy departments and religion departments, and uh, so one day on the way to there, I was being treated. There's an article I wrote in the New York Times called "A Long Conversation" about my 45 years of talking with his therapist Beatrice Beebe, who treated me for free, which is just wonderful. And um, even after I graduated, she was at the counseling center. And um, so I was going to th- see her for therapy one day, and I uh, picked up um, Kierkegaard's works of love. And uh, for some, some reason, he helped me make sense. Of, he made me help me to understand that uh, suffering is an action. It's not something you passively. Exp- it can be something you would do well or poorly. And at the time, I was really in bad shape. I mean, it was people didn't think I was going to make it. I was just so devastated when the woman I was with just left because she, she wanted to go back on drugs after five years. And uh, so, so the idea that suffering is uh, something you do that, that uh, has a certain dignity to it, and it's not a stench. You know, sometimes when you feel anxious and depressed, you just feel like crawling under the bed. You don't want to see anybody, and you feel it's embarrassing. And so uh, he helped me to uh, somehow help me to, uh, to take a different perspective on it. Hmm. On that, on that punk. That was there. Was there a work in particular of his that that meant more to you than another? Yeah, at the time it was works of love. Although, uh, 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 although I really can't. It's funny going back. I can't find like the passages where I absorbed that kind of a message, you know. Yeah. But um, he also made me uh, uh, think more seriously, or I hate to use these kind of terms because it seems like, it, but uh, about faith, you know. And 
that that was a that was quite a change. Mm-hmm. So good, a good, a good friend and part, uh, part of the part of the books that when I was kind of the idea was uh, well you've been walking with this guy taking instruction from him for thirty five years you know or whatever lived in Denmark for three years and you know I, I, I ought to be able to be able, be able to articulate some of his insights and so or what I've learned from him and you know whether it's right or wrong. And that was part of the motivation behind the book. So, um, so when you were you were on the Razor's Edge, you started. Who introduced you to Kierkegaard? How did it even occur to you? Well, I just, I just, well, I heard the name obviously yeah. from college, but and he was he was fairly popular in the sixties right. and oh, yeah. seventies. Yeah. But I just was in a bookstore. Mm-hmm. And as I said, the book I I stole a book. <laughs> and uh, and so you, so you started reading and um, yeah. And uh, and it led, and now you're. Do you cover in your your philosophy classes? Do you cover uh, other philosophers or poets? Uh, oh yeah, or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I, so, yeah, I teach. So I teach in the philosophy department. So yeah, in a class on existentialism. So okay. I teach Nietzsche, Camus, uh, Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. There was. A, there and was I was a, also an, I, mean, I was also in ancient philosophy too before I. I was at the University of Pennsylvania doing a P, in the PhD program for about four years when I was about. Just about to begin a dissertation on Plato when I ran into old CERN, hmm. and I transferred to Chicago, the University of Chicago. So, so what uh, what is existentialism or Kierkegaard? What do they have to say about? I mean, I know you touched on it already, but uh, if you could just expand a little bit, what do they say? What what in your mind? Um, what's their answer to the question of what is success? And and translate it for modern times, if you will. But what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What do you think they would have to say about it? in this world that we live in. And I, and I, and I will just mention, I, I read something, I can't recall exactly what it was, but uh, there was a reference to a, a Camus quote that you had that I, I think was especially, it was, I think, maybe the New York Times. But um, mm-hmm. what, what, would they, what would they say about this question in today's time? It's, it, it, there's no success like forever, and so there's no success at all. That's Bob Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No. Well, then to some extent, though, I mean, yeah, Kierkegaard, so they, they have different answers to that. For for someone like Kierkegaard, a successful life would be a life where you, um, uh, a life of faith, which he takes to be this trust in God against uh, against reason, and all that goes with it, all the actions that go with it. So they have different ideas about it. What would be a successful life uh, for someone like Sartre? Would be, and Nietzsche, it's a kind of self creation, mm-hmm. right, creating a certain. Create, creating yourself through your actions and uh, creativity. Uh, so the, the existentialists are, uh, have different different views on that. And um, but for the, the readers not familiar with existentialists, they're not they're they're grouped together uh, basically by some common themes, and they include both philosophers, poets, uh, psych, uh, psych, psychologists like you know, Rollo May and Irving Nolan, and theologians like Tillich. So it's a motley crew of people uh, that are unified in thinking about certain themes and things are choice, freedom, the individual, and it's inside-out perspective on life. But thinking about life, from, so one of the things that Kierkegaard said, I don't mean to start lecturing. No, no, I want you. I want you to lecture. This is all great. right. This all right. Why, yeah. Okay. Okay. So one of the things that Kierkegaard was in dialogue with his philosopher, a German idealist philosopher. Uh, uh, Hegel, who was uh, the most important philosopher of the 19th century, probably and it's, it's spurred Kierkegaard's works and Marxist. And uh, but he's a very speculative, ab- abstract thinker. Hegel was, and Kierkegaard talked about people thinking while forgetting they exist. And by that he meant, meant that people theorize and spout stuff and don't uh, relate it to their existence. So, for example, he he says uh, it was a beautiful passage in the postscript, concluding on scientific postscript, in which he says, "Look, I know um, I know all these facts about death," and he goes on for like I think maybe two pages about you know if I know if I take arc- arsenic I'll, I'll die, I know if uh, the the hero dies in the fifth act, but none of these objective facts tell me what it means to it means that I'm going to die, what death means to me. So this distinction between um, you know, objective knowledge and and personal meaning. So this mm. thinking of life from the inside out that I that's one of the things I find important in the existentialists. And, and Camus as well, he's like that, you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there because I, I, I want you to keep lecturing by the way, but two things come to mind. 
when you talk about this. For one, uh, what would you think of the movie Cinderella Man, just bringing it back to boxing? Remember? Well, Angelo Dundee, the guy in the corner, was my uh, mentor. Yeah, so I read that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not so, so, so let me tell you, I... I, I well. Okay, so my dad... Well, let me ask you a question. Wait a second. Yeah, ask What's me. What's the connection between Kierkegaard and Cinderella Man? I'm going to tell you. You ready? Okay. Yeah. I'm ready. Well, it, well, here's the... You are the connection, first of all. That's my okay. answer. But let me tell you. So my dad was a boxer. Uh, he he grew up uh, in West Texas, went to the Naval Academy. Uh, all right. he, Yep, and he was uh, 15, 16 years old. For whatever reason, he was kind of a rebellious kid, and uh, his dad was a banker and all this. Anyway, he started fighting Golden Gloves, and his yeah. buddy would drive him up to Amarillo from Lubbock, and he said, "I'd go wow. get, I'd go get beat up by these uh, young Hispanic boxers." <laughs> he yeah. goes, "He goes, I love boxing, but I wasn't very quick." And uh, yeah. then he went to the Naval Academy and started boxing. So my dad always loved boxing. So I grew up loving boxing. So by the way, just so you know, I read your book, not knowing, and then so more, I read a little bit more about you and your boxing connection, all that. I have an affinity. I love it, and it just made me more interested to to talk to you. But I'm going to bring it yeah. back. To, I'm going to bring it back to Cinderella Man. So on the boxing, when I grew up, my dad and what's funny is when I was growing up, you know, in the I was in the in the seventies, you could watch Muhammad Ali on Saturday night, right? It was on right. on regular TV. Wide world of sports, something like that. Yeah, yeah, you could just watch the guy box, you know. Yeah. And yeah. so, but my dad took me uh, to when 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 we were kings. I think was the documentary, you know. The, oh yeah, the, sure. Yeah. yeah. The, which was so, and I'd highly recommend it to anybody if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it was beautiful, wasn't it? And yeah. then when I was uh, seven years old, um, you know, back then they didn't have PG-13. They had PG and R, right? Those are movies. Right. Rocky, right. I'm pretty sure it was R, but my dad was like, we're going to Rocky. And it's so funny because my kids, I mean, my, I have three boys, and we all, Rocky's like one of my favorite movies, but I think it's so. The yeah, first one was good, but the rest of them. Oh, were yeah. Off. No, no. I'm, I'm, talk, off, I'm talking about 1976, the very first Rocky. Yeah, that one. The first yeah. one was good. So was my dad, for... and my dad taught me to box. So I, I learned from oh, a very cool. young age, like, you know, how to box. So I'm bringing it back to Cinderella yeah. Man. Do you remember yeah. Paul? Is it Paul Giamatti, I think, is the guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So remember when he's screaming at Jimmy and he's saying, hit him from the inside out. Remember that? Yeah. If, if anyway, it is the I just I love it. I love that, and it's like that was a good movie. Yeah, he did oh, a good job of that. But I love yeah. the I love the inside out thing. So I'm bringing it back to Kierkegaard. He was saying, if I'm so, not, yeah, okay. Oh, there you go. Right. Oh, man, that was that was tricky, <laughs> dude. I, I I know I brought oh, it back to you. That was good, man. So that was one. So Kierkegaard from the inside out, and then the other one. I don't know if you read a bunch of Hemingway. I read a lot of Hemingway. Yeah. So he had this one, and and he, somebody recounted this, which I love. And he said, uh, "This is not quite as tied, but just maybe think about you about uh, thinking but not living." Who was who said that? You were just talking about that. Somebody about thinking not living. Hegel was saying oh, no, that, thank right? You. Um, no, Kierkegaard accused Hegel of thinking while forgetting he exists. For thinking and while forgetting he exists, yeah. Yeah, that's so like someone who spouts all the stuff about social yeah. justice. Yeah, and doesn't relate it to their life in any way. Okay, so I want to come back to that, but that Hemingway had a funny a story. Apparently, he liked to tell, and uh, it was about a boxer. And uh, what's it called? Well, it's it's Hemingway. It was just you know he was. Yeah, what was the name of the story? I don't know. It wasn't a story he wrote. It was just a story he would tell people. Oh, he would tell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was about two boxers, and the one boxer they're, they're going to have a big fight, and uh, a reporter comes to one boxer and says, uh, um, "You know, how do you plan to beat this guy? He's." Uh, you know, he's a really smart fighter, I hear. And he said, and the guy responds, he says, uh, well, I'm going to hit him while he's thinking. Hit him while he's thinking, okay. Anyway, okay. I always thought that was so funny. Yeah. Anyway. Well, it's a big thing in boxing. To, the, only, the, only, the only way you can beat someone who's a quicker and maybe a better fighter than you is to punch when the other guy's punching. That's super important. It's, you know, you don't want, don't want to be on offense and defense, offense, defense. you got to punch at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, that, that, and that's how you beat speed. So who's the best? Okay. Who's the who's the best fighter today? You think? Best fighter today, uh, probably Lomachenko. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big. I was a. I'm a big Triple G fan, but I think he's deteriorated. So I'm Lomachenko's, but yeah, and Crawford, Terrence Crawford. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're beautiful. And what about uh, of all time? Who do you think the top few boxers are? Sugar Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis, Ali's up there. There's a bunch of them. I have to vote for the Hall of Fame all the time, so yeah, it's tough, it's a tough question. And it's a, a close different years. So. Yeah, right. That's going to ask but, you. But uh, but uh, but uh, almost everyone reckon uh, Harry Greb was another one who fought that 350 fights, beat Gene T Tony once. Uh, he's another one that that was um, amazing. Um, yeah, so 
Go to crew. Yeah. What do you, Mike Tyson in his prime? I understand you know Mike, right, Mr. Tyson? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yep. What, what, how do you think? How do you think of him as as just a fighter in his prime? What, where do you think he ranks? I thought he was going to be the greatest ever, but he never came back when he was behind in a fight and really panicked about getting into later rounds and uh, incredibly explosive. He's uh, gone through drills, did a couple of drills with him, and he's got an electric body and just powerful. But it was really tough for him to deal with a fighter six foot four, six foot five, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was never stayed in condition. Didn't you know? He, you know, in order to fight that kind of style that he 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 fought, or even you know Joe Frazier fought, you have to move your head a lot. You have to really be in incredible condition and just. And uh, he he wasn't able to have the they didn't have didn't have that discipline. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But what's that now? Let's see you relate that to Kierkegaard. <laughs> I already I already get, did my best. I already I, the inside. Did you? That, yeah, you're, yeah, I'm gonna go with that. Okay, yeah, I'm so, supposed to be lecturing on existentialism. And you're, I got kids in my class that'll do that. Hey, Doc, what do you think of someone so as a boxer? <laughs> no, we're coming back. Well, and, you they know, know, and they know I'll go off. They, they, yeah. they, they know they can get me. You know. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read this quote to you. This was from 2009, and, and um, I think you wrote this, but it's a quote um, uh, from Kierkegaard. A human being is a synthesis of the infinite oh. and the finite, of the temporal and the eternal, of freedom and necessity. Can you talk about that? What what do you and, and this is in the context of despair and the distinction you make between despair and depression. What's uh, that got to do with boxing? I'm I'm jumping all over the place. I only got only, forty yeah, I yeah. got forty five minutes. Kid. Hey, this yeah, is yeah. Yeah. No, no, hey, no, we're no, all no, existentialists now. No. This is there's nothing linear about this, okay? Come on. I'm really yeah. that. No, so oh, that that quote's very important because he's he's saying that we have these uh, human beings have these dual aspects, uh, you know, freedom and necessity, uh, um the eternal in us and the temporal, and that part of the task of being human beings is to relate these two aspects to to one another. So uh, he'll say that uh, um, uh, uh, it's, it's to unify these contradictions. So these two different dimensions of ourselves, mm. and that that part of the task of becoming a human being is to uh, oh, in terms of despair, it also means that people can go off into one side or the other. So one one of the ways he analyzes despair is to say that. Um, uh, some people are all necessity, uh, and they don't lack any. They don't lack. They lack possibility, right? So they have no imagination. They don't have the expansive factor. They just have the constricting factor. Mm-hmm. So we have this. We have this expansive factor of imagination and everything, but we also have to bring it back to reality in terms of actions and you know concrete decisions. And he says, one way of thinking about the spirit people going off you know to one side or the other. Like, um, and I have students that take classes that just. Oh, I want the job, and I want to become an actuary, and blah 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 blah. You know, that's that would be a, the form of despair that where you lack possibility. Mm. Right? And then now I have others who go, uh, I want to be a great novelist. I'll say, well, let's try writing a couple of short stories. No, no, I want to be, you know, so they're off in the clouds. Yeah. You know, you know, so that that kind of so that's one of the ways he thought about despair. Um. Well, I want to bring it back to boxing. I actually think the metaphor, like, I think it's, I think it's interesting that you're into boxing. I think about this. I, I, I have discussions all the time and think about this. I think um, this is something that hits home for me. That the kind of the intersection of of uh, the old debate between transcendence and imminence, right? You've got. I want to be able to see over the cliff uh, because uh, you know what's coming and and trying to bring home, you know, to our day to day lives what this kind of uh, morass mess that we're in. I just I just lost it for, for a second, John. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, I the with boxing, I think it's funny because you sit here and you think about, hey, where do we fit in to this, I don't know, eternal life, right, that we may, you know, and, and we, we've got this little period of time. What I think about mm-hmm. boxing is you can be a philosopher all you want, but you still got to pay rent or you got to pay your gas bill. And, um, you know, it's like you can, you can be, you can have your head in the clouds all you want, but like in boxing, he still may hit you in the nose. And, um, you you have a, you have a quote in here about, uh, life is like, uh, or is full of whirling blades. Um, you know, and so it's, it's interesting because I think this is why I'm so fascinated by Kierkegaard and why I loved reading your stuff is there's this, uh, you know, this, this constant battle between, uh, you know, permanence and, and what's temporal, and, right. and how do right. we how do we reconcile these things? And right. so, right. Uh, you know, well, it's not a matter of reconcile. It's just important to recognize. It's, it's, it's really a matter of just recognizing that there's 
so much suffering I'm going to go through in life. And even those of us who are privileged to have jobs and, you know, a place in our home and everything, and uh, but there's so much suffering in life. And uh, one of the things about the existentials is that they address kind of the, the inner demons, the anxiety, depression, things like that, that we have to deal with in order to be good human beings. You know, so the, that's, what, that's one of the things I think is special about them. Do you um uh, he's a little bit controversial and so I don't want to make this about him but do you do you re- read anything about Jordan Peterson? I have people have recommended him to me quite a bit, I, I, but I haven't read anything. I have and I've got some YouTube's by him that I haven't seen yet, but I've heard, I've heard a lot about him. He's got he's gone viral. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he's everywhere, and um, you know, without yeah. getting into like or not like, I think one of the yeah, in- like, interesting yeah. things that he says is about hey, you know, life is suffering, right? Just. Yeah. Just deal with it. Life is suffering. And so, and I love uh, a lot, you know, and so, and I think that's, I, I, that's what I thought of, by the way, when I read your quote about uh, the, the whirring bra- uh, blades, um, mm. because it's like, hey, it's, you know, you started by saying, hey, it's, it's how you deal with it. Suffering, you know, the question of suffering is how you deal with it, right? It's like, you can deal with yeah. it well, or you can deal with it poorly. Um, let me read something else to you. And because um, I read this in your book and thought it was fascinating. Uh, very interesting about um, the nature of going, going to this question of despair. Um, and people always say, you know, this almost cliche, this notion of existential despair, or whatever that means. But right. an, an individual in despair despairs over something. And then uh, the quote, um, for example, when the ambitious man whose slogan is either Caesar or nothing does not oh, get yeah. to be Caesar, he despairs over it precisely because he did not get to be Caesar and he cannot bear to be himself. And then later right. you talk about... That's a great quote from Kier- I think it's one of the... Kier- it's Kier- a great, great quote. Let, and, and let me follow yeah. on and then let you just kind of, if you would, just sort of uh, talk about it for a minute. So on the one hand, you have either Caesar or nothing. If you don't get to be Caesar, then you're upset because, or you have despair because you can't bear to be yourself. And then right. the flip side is he raises the question of the man who, um, who becomes Caesar uh, and, and runs the risk of experiencing despair because they never... Uh, they never understand the kind of uh, the alternative, right? You so you're Caesar, and you never know who you might could have been. So um, well, let me lecture. Okay, let me lecture a little bit. Yeah, lecture. Let me give yeah, you the okay. give you the floor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's that's a passage I, I use all the time in my classes, and uh, so the idea is that if you, uh, it's almost like you, have, you can think of the self, the three selves: is there's, the, there's concrete, the your real self, your ideal self, and then there's this self that you were meant to be. And, uh, for example, when I was in college, I was just completely fixated on playing in the NFL. And that's, you know, I didn't care that much about the Vietnam War. All I wanted to care about was football. And uh, when I, I, I couldn't imagine myself without football. When that came crashing down, I got into drugs and other ways. I couldn't stand being myself. I didn't want to be myself without being a football player, right? And th- that's so it was a kind of, it's kind of a self-hatred. I don't want to be myself if I can't be with so-and-so or if I can't be a novelist or whatever, right? Uh, but kid, so, and so this, he talks of their despair of not wanting to be yourself, which is, uh, which sounds a little bit like the, you know, depression. On the other hand, he says, if you do become Caesar, if you become super successful, then a lot of times you forget that the real task in life isn't to be, uh, you know, John Bezos or one of these billionaires, right? The real task in life is to be a, uh, a good human being, a servant, you know, in some way to others. And he thinks that people that really hit it big uh, and who are always told how great they are, right? I mean, if you have money, no one ever gives you any crap. They just pass on the, right. especially, if you give out, especially if you can give out money. Like, right. well, these robber barons built these, I mean, exploited the hell out of people, right? But they built these libraries and got all these oh, yeah. awards for being, uh, you know, great human beings, you know, it just makes me sick, some of that stuff. But so he thinks that if you are successful in worldly terms, there's a good chance you'll forget that your real task is to be a certain kind of person, right? Yeah. So And so despair is an ignorance of a refusal to be the self. It doesn't involve any feelings. That's why I distinguish it between, I think you can get from Kierkegaard this distinction between despair and depression, right? So most people think of despair as this feeling, right? Whereas Kierkegaard says, no, it takes these... It's it's not a feeling. It's a it's an activity. It's a certain ignorance. It's an ignorance of who you are, who you should be. And, and he thinks in many cases it's a, it's a willed ignorance. We don't want to know because if we if we knew, we'd have to make a lot of sacrifices. You'd have to give up your flight, your your uh, 
you, you, you drive for success to doing something else, maybe. How do you reconcile, um, or maybe maybe it's not a reconciliation, um, but the this we started talking about the American dream and this notion of, yeah. of the dream, right? And I mean, I, I presume there's a place for ambition, or there's a place for yeah. hey, I want to be a novelist, and maybe it works right. out, maybe it doesn't. Maybe if it works out, it may work out because you had to work really hard at it. Or on the other hand, maybe you want to be a, an NFL football player, but I'm from Texas. We have a guy, Jordan Shipley. Who we just had big Texas OU weekend this past weekend. Jordan Shipley, ten years ago, absolute hero of that game. Love the guy, incredibly hard worker, very fast, turned the game around, and but he could never keep his knee healthy, right? So his dream right. of playing in the NFL was, you know, he absolutely had the tools to play in the NFL. He was oh, fat. Yeah. He was like Wes Welker, right? That kind of player. And Marcus Dupree. Go yeah. check out his dream. Yeah, so, so, was, so, you yeah. know, his dream, but he didn't get, because of physical limitations, some people don't get to, yeah, you actually, know, get their yeah. dream because they don't work hard enough. Right. Um, talk about that. What's, uh, how, what do you think is the appropriate, and maybe you can put it in terms no, of thought, Kierkegaard? So, so Kierkegaard, he would say there's, there's nothing wrong with having an ambition of uh, being X or Y, but that shouldn't be your ultimate, uh, that, that shouldn't be the ultimate measure of the self, right? I should, I should, you know, and I can get, if I'm, um, you know, uh, certain ambitions don't work out. It's appropriate to feel sad and everything, but uh, never to forget that you're real. Look, so look at all these. I mean, that's uh, I wrote this piece for the New York Times of uh, uh, two years ago on against against do what you love. I mean, there's so many people in the world who got to put their any kind of dreams away to take care of their family, right? I mean, uh, that's you know that they can't like, oh, I got to go follow my passion and be an artist uh, when they got kids or you know, sick mother or something to take care of. It's uh, 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 so Kierkegaard would say it's yeah, it's okay to have ambitions, but you don't want that to be the ultimate measure of whether or not you love yourself, care about yourself. So would Kierkegaard, <clears throat> would Kierkegaard say uh, you got a dream to be an artist, but you have responsibilities to take care of your sick mother? For crying out loud, go take care of your sick mother. Yeah, probably. Yeah. He'd yeah. Say, okay. Yeah. That, that that there's nothing. Uh, yeah. Don't don't. There you don't follow your your passion. You do what's do the right thing. You know. I but, love that. But, actually, but, that's that's really uh, that's that's. I mean, that's very clarifying, right? I mean, I think people are out there searching for. And by the way, this we boy we we've got some fifteen minutes left. I we talk about this stuff all the time. The this notion, and and I would like for you to talk specifically about it because because hey, you raised it. But <laughs> this idea of pursuing your passion and uh and 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 in in america you know it's like tony robbins right and uh, right, every, everything right. it's and by the way and, and kierkegaard was a christian i want to hear like your thoughts about that because he clearly was was uh believed in god and was a christian and how that impacted but you see these things both and you see it in the christian world you see it in the non-christian world it's like hey and i'm gonna tell you one funny story and i'd like your take on it and then let you just kind of expound i was sitting on a panel a few years ago and uh, one of these guys was like, hey, you can do anything you want. You just set your mind to it, right? And, right. and and I get it, right? I love that on the one hand. But on the other hand, I'm like, okay. And I said this on the panel. I'm like, I wish it were true because I've always wanted to be able to run fast. And I'm not. Right. Yeah, and me so, too. And so I could say, oh, yeah, I read that, that you said you weren't fast enough. Well, I definitely wasn't fast enough. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah. I couldn't have even played high school football as a receiver because I wasn't fast enough. And right, so I would right. run through all the exercises, and and I remember saying, like, well, I said like I could run and run and run, and I could hire every exactly. coach all the time, right. and I'm not going to run as fast as you know Willie Galt or yeah. somebody, right? It's just not right. going to happen. And he said right. to me, he goes, well, actually, yeah, I'm not going to say it probably could happen if you would, I'm like, no, no, see, it would. Oh, get out of here! Right? Exactly. So okay, I'm turning the floor over to you again. And that's here. true. That's true. Of the writing too, Ben. It's just like when I when I was a. Uh, I only got about ten minutes, probably about eight minutes left because I have to go meet some students. Uh, but, but um, when I started uh, right when I was in graduate school, I thought, oh, if I just work hard enough, I could I'll be able to write like Kierkegaard. No, my friend, there's a there's a matter of a little gift there. You yeah, know? Right. Not everybody has it. You know. So, what's, so what, I, I think that's right. So what do you think? What's the disconnect? Where where did we go wrong here in your mind? Or because I think that's true. Like I we have this idea of self-fulfillment dream you can do anything you want and 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 lord knows i'm not gonna i'm like i don't want to discourage my children or somebody say right but what what do you think about that like hey yeah we'll encourage and dream big and do you know what do you think yeah encourage and dream big but again don't don't forget about the ultimate the ultimate question the ultimate issue is what kind of person you are 
Yeah, and so for example, I know that um, my obsession with um, making it to the NFL and stuff uh, it did did not help me be a better person, boy. I mean, I, I was willing to do just about anything to to do that, and and also when it didn't work out, man, I didn't want to live, you know, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, that's when these things consume. Don't let these things consume your sense of identity. Don't let these dreams consume your whole sense of identity. And I know that's hard to really commit yourself to something. Without the, and that, that that does mean heartbreak when it doesn't work out. So, so it's also I guess we'd have to have this this ability to deal with heartbreak when when things don't work out. Mm. You know, you know, and uh, that's something we have a low tolerance for in society, don't you think? I do. You know, dealing you know, with just like oh man, you know, like you never let <laughs> everyone knows how, how you know if you ask me how how you doing there, and you're supposed to say oh great, you know, I go I could complain, you know. You know totally. You're not allowed to have you know, bad things happen. You're supposed to just, I don't know, be cheerful or something. Yeah. So I think we need more, more room in our society to, to, for disappointment. <laughs> so, so, you know? so, um, is it is is happiness? I mean, uh, is it is it contentment? Is it? Um, uh, I mean, it, it's you know, for Kierkegaard. I don't know how he would differentiate because he had, um, you know, as a Christian, and I don't know where you fall on that spectrum. If you feel like, do you, can you have Kierkegaard without Christ? Or I mean, yeah. I, I think I, I, yeah, yeah, everyone wants to because <laughs> what people what people don't like about Kierkegaard is uh, for Kierkegaard he thinks you you can't be a, that uh, no, um, most important thing is to be what he calls a serious or earnest individual, and he thinks there's no real earnestness without obedience and no obedience without authority, and so everyone wants the Kierkegaard without that stuff. They don't like we don't like obedience. Don't tell me what to do. You know, <laughs> right. that's yeah. it. You know, yeah. But, but, you know, they, uh, it's like, uh, you know, so that's why uh, mindfulness, yoga, anything, but, but I want the sacred, but don't, don't tell me what to do. You know, so he would, uh, so yeah, so he was, he was pretty adamant about that. It's really something that's very much ignored in the Kierkegaard world, his emphasis on obedience. Yeah. And, and so what, so how did you, how do you trace from Kierkegaard to Sartre and Camus, who clearly had a very different worldview from Kierkegaard, but still they're considered... I guess his descendants, right? Philosophically, right, right. Well, how well, how did well, that work? Well, I, I certainly think the emphasis, the, the World War, certainly helped. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they, uh, the existential was always, always popular after the First and Second World War, mm-hmm. but his emphasis on anxiety was certainly something Sartre picked up. Although, in, a, in an interview in Playboy, he once said he never felt anxious that it was just very popular at the time. <laughs> yeah, <You know>, so <laughs> right. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. But but also the, this kind of recognition of the limits of rationality, right? That there's all kinds of, you know, you you can't, your reason can't decide all kinds of moral questions. And, and uh, uh, so so they shared this notion of the limits of abstract thinking. Hmm. You know. What, what do you, what do, so what do you think of the guys who are um, the, the, the self-help of, um, you know, work this this thing. I mean, what would your counsel be? I guess you've already said it, but I mean, you see, and I hate to name a name. I'm trying to dance around like Tony Robbins, yeah, the yeah, yeah, guy. But, but I mean, do you, you think it's nonsense, or do you just do you think it's self- no, no? There's there's some bit of every day I get this like uh, stuff on the email, like seven steps to self forgiveness, or you know, all kinds of stuff like that, and these this kind of lifestyle engineering, uh, which I think is you know is pretty. Can be somewhat poisonous, and one of the points in the book I, I try to make is that, uh, and insurance companies don't like this, but it's all. I mean, healing is healing psychologically is all about relationships. So I think it has a lot to do with relationships, and that means vulnerability. And most people don't don't like that. We'd rather take pills or, or um, you know, do cognitive behavioral therapy where you just see somebody ten times, could change your thoughts a little bit. And so I think there's a lot of resistance to the vulnerability that comes with relationships, which I think are. Very important in becoming a uh, being renewed, you know, hmm. psychologically. What do you see as the biggest challenge uh, when when you you're teaching young men and women? I guess so. You're undergrad, right? So you're are you teaching graduate level stuff as well, or, or mostly up? I have both because I have a research center at the latter. Uh, biggest um, challenge. What, what do you think? Just if you were to identify, and it's so not fair to just categorize a whole group of kids, uh, but but. But would you do it? <laughs> to say, yeah, yeah. What, I, what I do you think? Is, is, there a, is there an ethos in this that's maybe different from before that, uh, that you see over and over? Any patterns? Well, for, I mean, for, cognitively, there's a, I do like to do a lot of very close readings, you know, line-by-line readings of the text. And boy, there's not much patience for that right now. 
Uh, and so, and like for example, every year the, the syllabus gets shorter and shorter readings. So there's that. They kind of like, but let's just get to the point. You know, that's what's the point? What's the you know, what's the main idea? Mm. So there's kind of impatience, and then also, you know, that there 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 are the tremendous anxiety about success and uh, you know getting a job, which to some extent, you know, given you know given the cost of college and the issues around um, health care. For people that are don't don't have trust trust funds coming down the line, uh, that's serious stuff, man. You know, so I understand that. But the anxiety, so in order to, they have to quell their anxiety enough to take some of these ser- questions seriously. Mm. Don't think of them as a joke, you know. If you were to, I, love them. I know you got to go. I know you got to go here pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. A couple of quick questions for you, and 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 I think you've already touched on a little bit. But if you uh, if you just had a one on one with a 22 year old who's got a degree and whatever. Um, and you were saying, listen, uh, listen here, let me tell you if there's just one sentence or something that I could instruct you or tell you to do. Oh man. One of those deals. Yeah. Well, you know what, what, you know, tw- you might, you might say, go, okay, yeah, well, you might yeah, say, go yeah. read Kierkegaard. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? I, I, I would, go, I would go with what I've been saying about, you know, let's talk a little bit about what kind of human being you want to be. Yeah. Who do you look up to? Who do you admire? What kind of person do you want to be at the end? Yeah. That there's a lot of things you can't control in life, and so these ambitions are fine and great, and go for it. But what kind of person do you want to be, mm. and why? Mm. So that's that's one. That's one. I that's a lecture I give a lot, a sermon I give a lot. How important is sleep to being a good person? Sleep? Yeah, I wouldn't know, man. I'm insomniac from way back. Okay, so I hope it's not too important. <laughs> How much sleep do you get? Uh, maybe four hours a night, something like that. Oh wow. When do you, yeah. so do you, do you... Well, but that, that to some extent comes, to, I mean, I had a lot to it. My parents were always fighting in the middle of the night. You know, I'm like, uh, just, you know, oh my God, what's that, you know, so... Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so we, uh, we've, we've talked to a lot of people. We always, because I used to have a hard time going to sleep, but then I'd sleep, and now I have a easy time going to sleep, but I wake up in the night, and it's just one of the things I like to ask, because we hear it, different people say, oh, I can get by, so... Do you feel like, uh, does it work for you, the four hours? you feel alert? you wish you could... I'm a mess, man. I'm a mess. <laughs> I really am. I'm screwed up. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only... Uh, the existential survival guide. I'm barely surviving, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Oh. Well, oh, it's see. hard. No, it's really, you know, it's hard. With, no, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I've had a lot of illness in the family. My wife's had cancer, Parkinson's, and stuff like that. So I'm oh. always... It's kind of like... Uh, it makes it hard to relax sometimes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and the sleep, the lack of sleep, swimming doesn't help. So I think Coach here thinks sleep is important. Yeah, well, we do. T- I do too. I just I wish I could get more of it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I listen. I I really appreciate the time, and and I I want to stay in touch with you. And um, oh yeah, John, thanks so much, and uh, your staff there for hanging in there with me. I really, uh, and, uh, it's been fun. You've been fun talking with you. Oh, I've loved it. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna I'm gonna reach out to you offline as well, and anytime, want to anytime. stay in touch. Okay. Anytime. Be well, my friend. Gordon, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in today. Breakfast at Stinson's. We are very happy to have you. Next week, we'll be back with another great guest. So please join us. In the meantime, come visit us at Stinson's. We're at 45th and Burnett Road. Come have a taco, a coffee, or a cocktail. Look forward to seeing you. Thanks. <laughs>